Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Database Administration Virtual uh, Chapter Lecture today. Um, Paraj, are you able to see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Today's topic is modernizing SQL Server the right way, and Paresh Matawala is going to be our speaker. I'm Julie Bloomquist, and I'm the moderator for today. And I just wanted to let you know that HVR Software is our sponsor uh, for the DBA virtual chapter. Uh, they have a live demo links on their website, and we will be having uh, lectures from them in the future. If you are going to be going to the past 2019 summit, uh, go ahead and uh, you have a we have a discount code VG Disc Go E, and this will get you a $150 uh, discount. Uh, there's general sessions have already uh, been released for the summit. You can take a look on that. Uh, the prices did increase May 31st, but I think there's uh, another increase down the road, so you can uh, have a savings prior to the next increase. PAST has a large number of virtual chapters. Uh, these are listed. You could go take your PAST login and associate it with any of the virtual chapter groups. You only get emails about the meetings which are coming up so that you can attend. All of the PAST virtual group uh, lectures are recorded and are published on the archive sites of the individual groups. There's some upcoming SQL Saturdays. These are one day mini conferences, and these are the locations which are coming up in June and July. Uh, and here's the information on uh, staying connected with uh, the SQL Pass community. Uh, so today we have Paresh, and he's an Azure Big Data enthusiast and a manager of the database platform teams has led to several large SQL implementations, migrations, and upgrades. He's managed multi-terabyte OLTP databases. He also has been a senior SQL DBA and a solutions architect in Fortune 100 companies. He helps organize and speaks at many SQL Saturdays, Azure Bootcamp, Azure Data Fest, and user groups, including the Boston BI user group, any SQL past DB, PASS um, PD virtual group and the PASS DBA virtual group. He's certified in big data, analytics, fintech, PMP, public speaking, business communications, and he's an avid singer, cook, and open networker with stand-up uh, comedian. He teaches public speaking, debating, interviewing, and group discussion skills and mentors children around the globe via the circleofgrowth.com. Uh, very active person. So Paresh, I'm going to uh, switch over and make you the presenter. Yes, thank you. Oh, man. That's awesome. Uh, hold on. Uh, hold on, I have to make I can request it too, so. Did, did you take it or can you request it? It's. Uh, it shows both of us as doing the same thing. So let me see if I can actually share my screen. If that, okay. Okay, there you go. Yay, something worked. Awesome. Cool. Okay, hey, let me. Hey guys, everybody. How yes, I see. Everybody doing good, I hope. Uh, I think this is our first uh, webinar of the summer. And it's about. 90 degrees here in Boston area. So thank you folks. I won't take too much of your time. So I did this presentation earlier this month um, as we uh, at the Boston area, we had about 120 people registered and then sun showed up and then the attendance dropped significantly. But we had about 50 people who entered uh, the hall and we had a real hands-on uh, workshop on this too. So if you are local and if you would like to approach one of your local chapters to arrange for this uh, for your group, then please reach out to your chapter leaders. Uh, 
this would be great if you can make it interactive also uh, feel free to ask questions and julie will pass them along to me um, and julie just uh, feel free to interrupt when i'm talking if there are any questions that need immediate attention okay so without much ado let me start um, so as uh, julie said this is uh, paresh motiwala and um, i've been doing the sql work for almost 22 years now and um, if the slides move, that will be awesome. Yes, they do. So that's my Twitter handle. If you feel this is great, just go ahead and tweet about it. Even if it is not great, just say it is great and tweet about it. And that's uh, the past DBA virtual chapter, which I'm also part of the leadership team here. And let's start. So why do we so, have to upgrade? Paresh, I'm seeing it uh, not as a slideshow. It's showing me next slide and no notes on the screen as well. Okay, which I can see that, I don't know how to do this. Let me see this. Uh, if, if not, we could just move forward. Yeah, that's fine. I don't think it's a big deal to see all slides now. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah so let's just move forward then. Yeah, let me just make this as small as possible then maybe. This is in presentation mode, so I don't know what heck happened there, but yeah, more slideshow option. Hide presenter view. This good? Yes. Oh, okay. So looks good. So there's somebody who has a question. I think maybe the same question. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Charles and whoever else it was. Okay, so why upgrade is the question, right? So a lot of the times we come across these situations where uh, you want to upgrade, but then the bosses and the people who actually write the checks feel, yeah, why? It's already working. Why do we want to upgrade it, right? So there are two aspects to this. Number one, if you are having a third-party software in-house, the chances are that the vendor might have upgraded his software, and then he will want you to upgrade yours. So that is one thing. Second reason why you want to upgrade is that you really don't want technical debt, right? So how many of you still have SQL 2008 in your organization and kicking well? Uh, so we'll talk about that, right? Okay, come on. So winter is coming. I think this is uh, Pam LaHood's uh, slide basically. Then she wanted to bring in the Game of Thrones feel to this because July 9 is the day when SQL 2008 will be buried for good. And there might only be some security patches that might be available, but any other support will not be available. So please put it down. If you have not already started planning for it, it's possibly too late, but at least now better than never. So, so July 9, remember, that's the key date here. Um, so is it the right time to modernize, right? So every time you think about this question, yes, it is always right, right? So few things that you want to wonder is, is, do I reduce the cost by migrating or modernizing my data platform? Actually, it does in a way if you see what, if you have the SQL 2012 or SQL 2008, chances are you're still running them on a hardware that was installed five or seven years ago, maybe 10 years ago, um, depending on which version it is. So you're still using old CPUs and you're using old spinning disks, uh, which is going to be coming in your way when you actually start to have higher volumes of data. So by actually modernizing your data platform, you will possibly be moving to a latest and the greatest of the hardware uh, or in Azure and where you will have the best of the CPUs. So you might actually not need to have a, say for example, if you have a 32 core machine uh, from five years ago, chances are you may not need to have a 32 core machine now because the cores that you have now are significantly faster than what they were having five years ago. So just keep that in mind, please. Then to maintain compliance, right? A lot of the GDPR initiatives and uh, the PHI and the PCI data, they need you to be compliant as far as security is concerned. So to maintain security, you definitely want to, and to maintain the compliance of your software and your organization's footprint in the industry, you need to maintain the compliance. And really, you don't want to be sleeping for 10 years to upgrade your database platform. The most usual excuse given by finance, I would say especially, is that, hey, it's already working, why do you want to fix it, right? 
So the reason is that um, in 2008, for example, you don't have in-memory tables. Uh, you don't have column store indexes. And that would only speed up your processes and uh, will actually make you look good. So your database team uh, will actually appear to be a good partner for the business rather than just as an expense center. To keep the vendor support, <clears throat> this is actually a double-edged sword. And uh, so what I would like to say is that if you are a vendor, you also want to make sure that you upgrade your database platform too. The reason why you want to do that is, for example, there are certain customers, and I'm, I don't know if you have anybody from Microsoft here today, but uh, they would tell you that they could not upgrade their uh, latest software because uh, three customers or five customers are still stuck up on SQL 2008 or SQL 2012. So just to overcome that possibility, you want to upgrade too. The other, the flip side of it is that you are ready to upgrade as a customer, but your vendor is slacking because the vendor is busy just providing new features as against going with the latest and the greatest. For example, they may work their butts off to giving you a very efficient query, which may not really be very, very important because now you can use column store indexes and so on. So. Uh, two ways uh, to keep the vendor support and for the vendor to keep the customer uh, in place. Yeah, so it's a lot of new features are available in this uh, software. So you may really, for example, the compiled DLLs, right? I mean, what a superb way to actually execute your uh, code. So three or four major improvements that have happened, you can now actually take care of with the upgrades. Um, so this is one question that has always kind of freaked out a lot of people is can I actually separate my application modernization with my data modernization? So what you could do is possibly uh, you can have your application go up by say one or two versions and still have the database at a slightly older version. Then one fine day you can actually upgrade your database to two degrees higher than what it is supposed to be in your application but yes you can do that is the bottom line and how we can do that is something we should be covering very shortly right so yes you can actually separate your application modernization cycles from your data modernization cycles and it is really easy to do so so any questions Julie any questions so far uh, no there aren't thank you right. cool so this is one thing that you might want to take home today with you is the database compatibility certification, right? So a lot of the times what happens is that when you want to say certify your application, your question is, should I certify it for cloud? Should I certify it for prem or both? This is one aspect of the question. The second is, should I certify it for SQL 2016? Should I certify it for 2017? Or should I certify it for 2019? So the question is wrong, uh, big buzzer. You don't need to do any of those anymore. You don't need to get stuck in that rut at all. And I'll tell you how you can do that. And the best way to do that is to certify your application on compatibility level, not on a specific version of SQL or one specific platform. So if that makes sense, I, we can actually, there's a lot of examples that will come along the way where we can actually show you this too. So this is, um, any certification process should be thought in terms of which target database compatibility level. Remember, that's what I was just telling you about. Uh, Microsoft has the this particular link, please note it down, it's also there. Just type DB Compat. Uh, in Google and you should be able to get this uh, link automatically. Uh, do read it out. It's really a great read. I did that as a preparation for my earlier presentation on June 8th in Boston. So let's go uh, key benefits, right? So simplified application certification uh, on premise and Azure, for example. Yeah, you can do that. It's easy. Nobody will actually even bother you. Even if you are going for a managed instance, for example, you can certify it for that level two. But do you need to just do that? No. So what will happen is that 
you could actually be on SQL 2017 and keep your compatibility level at SQL 2012 because your application still supports only SQL 2012 and work with that. So here you have a modern data platform which is actually running on a SQL 2012 compatibility level. So, and the third one, when you actually uh, decouple your application and database upgrade cycles, you become very free. For example, uh, can we go back like 15 years when you had a lot of applications still running on Access? Remember what used to happen is that when you release new code in Access, you had to replace the whole Access, not just the tables anymore. So you are not able to decouple. And that's one of the things that SQL brought along was that the table, the data was different from the code and you can now do that. So uh, you have the ability to do that. So here's biggest benefit of having the compatibility level certification. So if you go through the uh, database upgrade uh, advisor, for example, uh, it will give you that, okay, at certification level for 130 compatibility or 120 compatibility, if your database shows all green, and I have actually a live example for you there too, uh, which means that if something broke because of the upgrade advisor not giving you correct information, Microsoft stands to correct it for you. Okay, and they will, I don't know what the money part of it is. I think they will not charge it for you. They will enter it as a bug. This is what I remember from Pam Lahoud's session that they will enter it as a bug and fix it for you at no extra cost. So remember that is the massive, massive advantage for you on that. Uh, the key though is that the assessment tools have to run clean with no errors. Okay, so if there are no errors, then you should live happily ever after that. So, uh, Query plan shape. So this is something that you might want to just go ahead and look at very, very. So if you have similar hardware um, between the two versions of SQL Server, the query plan shape, you know, the way the query plan shows up in your when you see the estimated or the actual execution plan they should all show up as the same. And that means that whatever performed, it will not get worse. I do hope it will get better though. So that is the guarantee that Microsoft gives you. And the third one is they have now started maintaining more backward compatibility than a few years back. And I have a chart here in the next slide or two, which will actually show you how that actually happens. Okay. So for Microsoft, it is crucial that the prior versions of SQL are supported, even when it goes full stream, uh, developing newer and newer versions of SQL Server, right? Okay. So this is a table that I was referring to. For example, if you go down like to say 18 years back or 19 years back when you had SQL 2000, the only compatibility level that it could support is 80. So it could not support SQL compatibility level for SQL Server 7.0 or 6.5. Then in SQL 2005, it could support two. Then in 2008 through 2014, you can see that it could support three versions, which means one current and two prior. As you can see here in SQL 2012, one current and two prior, right? So, but that was all great because at that time, up to 2012, the software development for SQL was not absolutely regular. So for example, SQL 7 to SQL 2000 took them like what, about four years. Then SQL 2000 to 2005, oh my God, it took five years. And then 2008 took them two years. SQL 2008 release two took them six months. But <clears throat> now you see the average uh, time that they take to release the software is like, maybe one year, so you had a SQL 2016, now you have SQL 2017, and you have SQL 2019. So <clears throat> the bottom line is that today, if you install SQL 2019, it will support six compatibility levels. So even if your database is working on, I would say SQL 2008 compatibility level, it would still work on SQL 2019. 
but that will be for one database whereas the other databases which can actually enjoy the latest and the greatest they can be uh, on different versions as well so remember you want to worry about the compatibility level rather than the SQL version or the platform whether it is Azure or it is on-prem right so that I hope that kind of clears anything that is there and this table in this slide will be published for you if you already don't have it uh, feel free to download it later okay so we spoke about this so now let's look at some of the things that happen right because the whole idea of bringing a new version is to see how we can actually have better functionality which means that some other old functionality might have to and must die so that the newer versions can be done so there are two concepts here and which also something i want you to take home with you today is the deprecated uh, functions right which means that they will not be developed upon anymore and they also recommend highly that you stop working on the same uh, versions for example uh, mirroring in databases was deprecated two versions back right and now they are saying please don't do anything assuming that you're going to get mirroring why because you already have a always on availability group so easily available for you then comes a discontinued uh, functionality what is a discontinued functionality which means that it is now removed from the product right and you know, it says discontinuity, discontinued functionality introduced in a given SQL Server is not protected by compatibility level. So remember, not protected. So even if you have a compatibility level which is good, it will still tell you that this is not continued anymore. So you might really want to change that aspect of your code. Uh, some of the T SQL syntax, for example, the fast first row has now been removed. It has been replaced with, I think, row equal to one or five or something like that. And you can actually do that too. So here it is. So this is now gone. So it will produce an error number 321 and watch out for that. Okay. Uh, this can actually break some of your important reports that you might have. And remember, this is HR and you really don't want to mess with HR. So this is what I think there is some syntax error here. This, this doesn't always work. I have tried this the fast equal to one. But yes, you can actually do that. I think if you just tweak this around a little bit, you should be able to get the correct version. So breaking changes is the great new behavioral changes resulting in a very different outcome. And you might want to watch out for that. And I think there's some examples here too, for example, right? Um, if you say declare at value date time equal to such and such right then this is the result you would get select cast at value as date time too and you can see that the uh, there is a slight difference between the first and the second results in compatibility level 120 and 130 that this actually goes many more decimal places than in 120 so if you are say for example making money or making people some money based on third or the fourth digit in the decimal place then they might really start screaming at you because according to them they should have gotten thirty three thousand three hundred and thirty three dollars whereas you are giving them only thirty thousand dollars and it's not pretty so just watch out for that uh, breaking change uh, it will really help right <clears throat> then this for example is not protected so the query below works until uh, yeah, I think SQL 2005, but errors uh, like example, uh, select date part. See here it could decipher properly that uh, dash is a delimiter uh, and a slash is also a delimiter. But now that is gone, you have to use the same delimiter uh, in the entire date field. So that is something that you want to take home with you too so there are a few things that will change and when you actually run the database upgrade advisor it will actually tell you that in this stored procedure such and such code is likely to break or most likely it will break so just watch out for that too so the upgrade process okay we're just going to go through this this is slightly um, graphical so like any other process, right? If you look at this as a software development life cycle, what are you doing? You're discovering, you're assessing the thing and you want to convert that, right? And remediate the applications, 
right? Functional and performance tests are done. Then you go ahead and do the optimization. And finally, you migrate everything into production, right? Or the schema that change into production worthy thing. If something is broken, you have to keep on going through the cycle. Once you're steady and you are happy with the outcome, then you want to worry about the data sync, right? And then at one fine day, you want to actually cut over. So I also have a full one hour presentation on just this last, I don't know, what is the shape? One, two, three, four, five, six, hexagon of weird shape, right? So if you just want to learn about the cutover and how you can do a speedy cutover, uh, this is a superb uh, presentation. If you want, just go ahead and put it down in the chat room and we'll see if we can schedule one for you soon. I think me and Chris um, Lumna did this uh, year back and two years back, but we can always repeat that given the fact that now we have increasing uh, number of releases for SQL. So, so I'm just gonna go through this a little quick. Oh. Okay, so in the Discover, you want to go ahead and run the Microsoft Assessment and Planning Toolkit. This will actually go around your entire domain or your SQL realm, and it will tell you what you can upgrade, right? And then database migration assistant is, we have a live demo for that over here. And that will actually tell you what data type may not work for you. For example, end text is not supported anymore or something like that. Uh, two or three of those which are not um, supported anymore, it will actually bring it out to you. So if you are in the early stages of your migration planning, you might want to consider where all this is breaking and the amount of time it will take for you to fix it both upstream and downstream and then uh, plan your schedule accordingly and then the database experimentation assistant is also something which i do not have a demo for today but i have a walkthrough for it and it will actually tell you what if happens if i make this 130 what will break if i make it 140 what will work what will break and so on so Remember, these three tools you really want to take with you today. And there is also a query tuning advisor, which uh, is just something that we can work look at. So uh, this is the Salesforce's um, uh, sales pitch here, which we can totally avoid. I don't want to read it. I'm sure you guys can read it on your own too. Any questions so far? Well, now we get into slightly nittier and grittier nuts and bolts. Cool. So I'm not seeing any more questions. Okay, great. No worries. So I might either people are asleep or I'm doing an awesome job. One of the two. So let's go into the discover phase, right? We already looked at this chart earlier. So in the discover phase, you will actually have the map toolkit, which you can go. Uh, what it's basically a complete inventory of what you have. So if you have say, like we have a hundred servers where I work right now, uh, it will tell you the exact versions, the additions that you're using, what components are installed, whether you have SSAS, SSIS, SSRS, um, what else do you have there? And how many cores are there on each of the server? It will also tell you that information. Um, how many databases are there in each instance? What are the sizes? Uh, why is the size of the database important for you? Because when you are actually going to upgrade and move it to a new server, uh, you might want to provide for the extra time for that. But then I have some other workarounds uh, for that too. So if you guys want to know about it, please let me know. I would actually love to give you that presentation of a painless uh, migration, uh, the project approach rather than a pure technical approach. And what are the settings that you have, right? So this is all map toolkit will give you. Um, and it's pretty seamless. You just run it. It doesn't it doesn't harm anybody and it even actually tells you there's an Oracle product. So too bad. Then assess and convert, right? That's the second thing that you want to work on. So what you do is that you assess and convert with the database migration assistant. And just if you can show me if you would like to look at the database migration assistant now, or you would like to look at it later. I'll just wait for a quick response, otherwise we can actually switch over and go to that. Okay. So, we had one vote for now. Yeah, be it, please. Okay, cool. Now, now, now. 
Okay, after finishing the overview, now please, now please. Okay, I think there's a general trend to get it now. So let's honor their wishes. Um, it's not really going to break anything for you folks, so no panic there at all. Okay, thank you. Um, let me see if I have it here. So this is the one which I ran earlier. I downloaded a SQL 2008 Adventure Works. Uh, it's on my database here, server. Uh, here. This is the one. I can actually look it up and see the properties. And you can see the options. It's at 2008 compatibility level. Good. So when I ran the database migration assistant and I just created this demo for you, uh, as you can see, for some reason, whatever data it has, this is a light version of it. So it has literally no compatibility issues with either 140, 130, 120, any of the earlier versions at all, which is, that is the purpose. I just downloaded the light version, but yes, you can actually do it. And I'll show you how to do that too. And here it has some feature recommendations for you. And it says that, you know what, look at this column, for example, it's containing sensitive data. So maybe you can do some sort of an always encrypted kind of a thing for you. If there is a address and so on, you can actually go ahead and do that. So always on then one place it is saying that you can use transparent uh, data encryption also. But if you want to just go ahead and do this all over again, and then you can say, okay, you know what, I'm going to call it as an X and I'm going to say create and give me everything that goes here and then just run it. Um, I don't want to encrypt the connection, but you can. And I want to do this database and this database, for example, and start assessment. So it will take about 10 or 15 minutes to do this awesome thing. Just one really painful thing that I have actually uploaded as a request for Microsoft to enhance this product is that once you create a report out of the database migration assistant, you can only read it in JSON. You cannot reload that report back in the database migration assistant. I have no idea why Microsoft would ever do that, but they still did it. And I am not going to argue about that, but I have put it as a recommendation for them that if they can actually go ahead and do it. So as you can see, it is a small database, but it finished the, uh, uh, assessment pretty quick. So if you have a larger database, like one I have here, which is about three terabytes, it took it almost uh, 45 minutes to one hour, but it was definitely worth it. So if there's no questions on this, I would like to return to my uh, slide deck, which is here. Cool. And how do you say? So I think I did miss some previous questions. Um, I undocked it and now I see them. Um, Charles had asked, I may have missed it, which was the tool that uh, would report the SP code that might have the incompatibilities? This is the was one. Was that DMA? Yes. Okay, this is it. Features and access, yeah, okay. Charles, I hope you uh, answered your question. Actually, I have a valid, uh, but I can't show because that is all proprietary information here. Otherwise, I would have loved to show you this, but it actually will highlight which stored procedure and almost which line of the code is something which will break. So that is why this is an awesome. And once you have it certified by your data migration, as well, um, then you can rest assured that, you know, Microsoft will support it no matter what version it is. So definitely it's an awesome tool to run against. So um, uh, the other question was from Diane and it was, can I down, dial download dial down the map toolkit to only look at the servers that I provide it, like if she could provide it a list. Uh, excellent question. I don't know the exact answer to this. Uh, can I get back to you this? Uh, can I get back to you on this? Yep. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate that. Okay, um, that is one thing which I've done this three times already, nobody asked. So thank you. I will try to include that um, proactively for the next one, which is coming up in, SQL Saturday, Albany on July 20, same presentation, so. Oops, okay. sorry, one more. Yeah. 
in DMA, he doesn't see a 150 compatibility level from SQL Server 2019. Is there a reason for that? 150. You know, another great question because I have worked with uh, this only up to SQL 2017. And uh, because I have SQL 2017 installed on my machine, but I did not see that because I did not choose the target version, right? Let me see if I can actually do that for you. No, sorry. So if I can say X, uh, now I'll call it Y, and I say create. So yeah, you're right. There is nothing here for SQL 2019 yet. So I couldn't see it, maybe because I don't have SQL 2019 installed on this server. That could be a possibility because I, wait, I didn't even select the server. I, so it doesn't know where it is. So I think this is a, a feature that we can ask Microsoft. So I will put it in the uh, community feedback thing and they are pretty good about listening to it. So, and you're right, even- did, uh, One did, more for- Yeah, sure. <laughs> One more from Charles. Uh, does the does the DMA does the, the feature also help with assessing dynamic SQL coming in from app servers, or is it only static uh, accessing so, stored procedures? Let me well, let me share this. Go ahead. So logically, it is actually looking at what is there on that server currently. So it looks at the code that is there, not the code that might get generated. So what you could possibly do is that, say for example, if you do generate some dynamic query, then either through uh, trace or through, I don't know, through any other third party tool that you're using, if you can just go ahead and create that um, as a stored procedure and save it in the uh, database itself on the server, then it might actually uh, give you the correct thing that, oh my God, if you do this, uh, chances are this will break for you. But so far, because our target is the specific server that I'm looking at it, and if that SQL doesn't exist on that, then it will not find it. If that answers your question, maybe not possibly the best answer you would like to know, but unfortunately that is it. And I think this never actually happened before, that you had something like a database migration assistant and now at least we have, so if it is even covering 99% of our requirements, I think we should all be great. I wouldn't quite say grateful, but I think it is great for us to have that feature, so. Uh, can I go back to my presentation now? Yay, awesome. <laughs> yes, yes. So test and, uh, did I do the earlier one? Yes, we did that, cool. So test and optimize, right? That's one of the things which is in the circle here. You want to keep on doing this all along. And uh, without that, one of the things that I cannot stress enough is to benchmark every stuff that you do on your application. For example, your login button. Once you click on the login button, how many seconds before you get your uh, fully loaded page? Now, then. You want to benchmark each and every functionality in your application because the first thing that you will hear from the customer after you have uploaded, I mean, after you have upgraded your version to the latest and the greatest, that, oh, my application is slow, right? And at that time, if you have the pre and the post benchmarking results, then you can tell them that, uh, no, because last time you clicked on the login button, it took you three seconds to get a fully loaded page. Oh wait, now it takes two and a half seconds. So this comes, I don't want to go into the psychology of this, but generally speaking, users are wary of anything new. So if something new came along, they will first think just it's a slow thing. So just watch out for that. Okay. Um, benchmark all the time and do document every single benchmarking that you do, which will actually save your um, proverbial behind as you go along. So then um, database experimentation assistant, right? So it will tell you what are the compatibility level execution errors that it had. If there are any queries that were degraded because of the upgrade, uh, it is possible it can happen, which means that you might have to rewrite or re-engineer the queries a little bit. You can compare workload uh, so the way you can compare the workload is you can compare the workload on one version 
and you can compare it with the uh, workload on another server at the same version and on another server at a different version. So this will actually give you not only a workload as to how it works, but you can also make sure that the new hardware or supposedly a new hardware that your infrastructure team got for you is actually really beneficial. Like I have seen a case in which the new hardware was actually very, very detrimental to the overall upgrade process. And as it turns out there, uh, VMware host uh, did not have the latest and the greatest uh, adapter to the network, which would actually let them use the full bandwidth and also the same exact thing uh, for their storage. So only after we ran uh, this for the customer that we found out that yes, the latest and the greatest hardware bought was not as great as it had promised us to be. And that is why upon involving the vendor, they say, oh yeah, you should have ordered part one and part two, and then you will live happily ever after. We just uh, got the customer to do it for them and they acquired the part and we should be putting them in the production sometimes over the next couple of weeks. So remember you can, and uh, how many of you have actually run the traces? Remember you could actually replay the traces. You can actually do the same exact workload over here. You can actually replay the entire uh, experimentation that you have created on one server and actually see the effect of it for say 10 cases or a thousand cases or a million cases. So this is a great tool for all of us to have and uh, do actually try to download. It's free and you can still definitely work on it uh, on both versions of SQL. You can actually do the comparison and you can also compare it at a different compatibility level so far. Okay. Uh, then again, a sales pitch from Salesforce. Actually, I'm going to remove this. Because this is becoming too annoying. So yeah, they liked it. Basically, that's what they're trying to say. So uh, Now, Ad hoc, right? We already did this. Um, come on, go forward. So, in a real bad case, like as you can see, in compatibility level 140, so many things would have broken, and it gives you a complete list of it. Remember, if you save it, if you, you see that the small blue button at the bottom, it says export the report. It will save it as a JSON file, and I have yet to see a human being who actually likes reading JSON file. So if you are one of the people who likes to read JSON, or if you have a friendly JSON reader that we can use, I would love to see that too. So you see this one, rewrite the code, replace dbcc, db reindex to alter index with rebuild option, right? So it tells you almost everything there is to know, and it, you can see that, uh, in the earlier version, only 10 things would have broken, and in the higher versions, uh, 13 things, and then 14 things could have broken in the compatibility version of it, right? in the compatibility aspect of the test. Uh, <clears throat> then look at this one, right? Uh, remove user-defined type. Uh, SQL mail has been discontinued, for example. Geez, I mean, all of us already know that, right? So just watch out for that, and this will actually tell you a lot more. Uh, Walk through with a database experimentation assistant. So we say, okay, welcome to, once you load, it'll give you this screen to begin with and say capture a workload on a source server, replay the current workload on target one and target two and analyze the replay traces collected from target one and target two. So uh, you go to this one, click on the drop down menu here, uh, connect to the correct server. I don't know. I don't, don't want to go with the certificate, but this is exactly the type of report it will give you. So as you can see, query distribution, uh, only 28% of the queries now stand degraded, for example, but 78% or 70% of the queries now perform much better under SQL 2019, SQL 2017. Uh, so then it says distinct error queries, right? Upgrade blockers. So this is what you want to really look at the upgrade blockers. Uh, resolved errors, yes, something you can live by. No, they will be resolved, but the upgrade blockers is something you really want to fix. And for example, at the bottom of it, you can see that uh, the error ID count is there, the distinct queries that are 
degraded is like 36.6% but they improved are 53.7%. So this is by the number of times they have executed on the left side. On the right side you have distinct queries um, irrespective of the number of times they have done. Uh, let me go to the next screen. SQL 2000 migration. Come on. Okay. So upgrade blockers. These are the ones you definitely cannot upgrade uh, your database server without addressing the upgrade blockers. Uh, in the 2000 upgrade blockers, it actually tells you this is the query. There is an income incorrect syntax near the word compute. So a SQL developer would actually know this. This is definitely something you should involve your developers or the BI folks who are there with you, and they will actually tell you exactly. So you can see there are new errors, existing errors, resolved errors, and upgrade blockers. You can definitely look at this first. Believe me, this will really be great for you. So thank you. Then after you are done with the migration, right? What do we do after migration? Let's look at that, right? Okay. So. I've moved the data now. Am I done? Duh, no. So what happens is that this step is very crucial, right, for reconciling any data accuracy. So because some of the way the SQL functionality has changed with some code, it may have a different impact on some of the data that you are inserting into the tables and so on. So you might want to actually check those things out too and make sure that uh, all the reports before and after that you're running have the same exact figure before declaring a success. Okay. So upgrade to SQL Server latest. So this is what you want to do, and this is something that I cover in the next one too. Upgrade to the latest uh, SQL Server, uh, SQL Server version, but keep that source compatibility level as whatever you were originally on. Then enable the query store, which is, we didn't talk about it, but you want to enable the query store and take the performance of every single query very, very cleanly and very detailed. Uh, way to collect the data on a workload. Uh, what I would say is, say you want to collect it for one day or a week, I would strongly suggest collect it for a week because you want to do is, you want to collect this for a lean period. You want to collect it at a medium level of, uh, application stress and at a high volume, right? So all the three times, because if you really want to know the, how your query is going to perform or how your job is going to perform at its peak performance, then this is the best way to actually go ahead and do it, is to span it across multiple days, which would have covered. For example, if your month end is coming now, right? We are out on the 26th, our month end should be here in four uh, days now, which is basically half year. So you may have some half yearly processing. Some people have their financial year endings coming now. This is the perfect time for you to actually capture this data and uh, at literally no serious overheads. Um, then after you have done all this, set the DT, DB compatibility level to the latest version and then do all the stuff all over again because you want to see that at this version of the compatibility level, did anything break? Did anything actually go awry? Uh, irrespective of what Microsoft told me, right? I want to verify this for myself, right? Because you don't want to rewrite your resume. You want to really get this thing done right and done right the first time. There is no second take here. And quickly fix any regressions, right? So if there are any last known good plans, then go ahead and say, okay, use this now and then we will worry about fixing it in the next day or two and so that uh, hopefully the latest version is taken. So the query plans may actually change between the two compatibility versions and you might want to watch out for that too. Okay. Julie, how are we doing on questions? Okay, I'll proceed. Is there any good articles on East? Is there any good articles on easily collecting the workload baseline from the query store? I will actually send it to you. I have it buried somewhere here. Uh, there is a whole bunch of bibliography and resources at the end of this too. Uh, whoever it is, please either tweet me the question again or Julie, if you can just take down the name of the person who asked that and we can actually uh, answer all these questions in one shot and post it along with our video. 
Okay. Okay, cool. So in the query store, right, look at the regressed queries, okay? And you can see that um, the automatic plan correction feature that you see here is good, but sometimes it may not be great. And as you can see, so this plan number four sucks and you don't want to use that, you might actually want to go back to plan number three, which is slightly to the left. So this will actually give you multiple uh, inputs into how to use this. I have myself not used the query store much, but I would love to do this, especially since I have been instrumental in talking about this so much. So, and move. Okay, so query tuning assistant, right? So let's look at this. So this is the process that we already spoke about, right? But the first priority is to actually guide the users through the documented and recommended DB compatibility upgrade procedure with ease. So when the users could generally be people who are running those ad hoc reports, people who are developing your database objects, and even your DBAs who actually sometimes think they are developers and start writing queries, this can come to them, to their use very, very well. So Query Tuning Assistant, uh, the Microsoft, uh, the Map Toolkit, the Upgrade Advisor, right? These are the, and the database experimentation assistant. These are the four things you really want to start playing around with. Remember July 9th, okay. So can we force it to use an older plan? Yes, you can, but remember you want to really fix it so that it works better with the new one because um, you just can't use, the, you should not generally force a query to use a known plan unless you know that by using any other plan it is going to f break something right so if it is going to break something then it's fine but otherwise use whatever plan worked and if you fix it then go ahead and let it select its own plan so uh, you can actually download it in SSMS version 18 I have 18.1 on my thing and PowerShell also actually helps you do that so uh, these are some of the recommendations and analysis, correlation versus independence, and some of these things will come back to you with the right uh, results, and you will actually love this tool a lot. I'm going to actually do a one-hour one presentation just on the query store uh, for the upgrade advisor. So, and then deployment, create a perfect plan. Remember, make sure that you are going to involve every single stakeholder in this, right? <coughs> So three things you want to take home today, database migration assistant, database experimentation assistant, right, and the query tuning advisor. Three things, uh, they will actually be great for you. Uh, remember, the uh, you can actually also run the DMA if you think that you're going to be moving your database from on-prem to Azure. It will actually help you a lot in that too. So, so the key takeaways, right, for today, uh, start planning. Oops, actually let me rephrase that. If you have not started planning, it's too late. You might really want to take it on a war footing. Uh, review the database migration guide that is there in uh, published uh, on the Microsoft website under the documentation. Then familiarize yourself with these three and four awesome tools that we have. And then leverage database compatibility level to accelerate your modernization. And if you have to move to the higher version, this is the perfect time for you to do so. So these are some of the resources that, you know, there was somebody who was asking about database migration guide. Yes, here it is for you. So uh, Microsoft Map Toolkit is there. The overview of migration assistant, we actually do it completely ourselves. The experimentation assistant, I could not demo because we don't have the time for it. Is If you want this demo of the database experimentation assistant uh, and the query tuning advisor, please let us know. I would love to come back and present to you for another one hour session because mind you, this whole uh, modern migration tool was an eight hour session and my session was there only for one hour. The other one is how do you use modern hardware uh, that is supplied by Intel, for example, to make sure that your uh, upgrades go painlessly and are as efficient as possible. And then after that, we had a very three hour long lab so if you are also looking for a lab let me know we can actually try to work you through that okay so these are your uh, resources i do believe this might be the end of it so if you have any questions 
this is a perfect time to ask them. Hi, Parish. Uh, could you put your slide back up that says how people can contact you directly? And I'll, I'll get you uh, the questions um, so that you can make an additional post. I have one. What happens if the tool shows that the database is compatible, but the vendor will not support the latest compatibility level? And another one was, are these tools compatible with SQL 2005? Uh, so if you are using SQL 2005, uh, you need a different session. I can, I'm sorry, but there is nothing in the option that would actually help me see if it would work because the SQL 2008 that I have here was also downloaded specifically for today's exercise. So this is another thing that I can actually check out for you. Uh, I think logically, yes, it should work, but I don't know 100%. So, so this is awesome because what is happening is that we are getting questions that have not been asked by in-person presentations also. So this is really three or four questions which are brand new. I will include them in my presentations and I will also ask, uh, give you the answers back. Let me see for those who are looking at my presentation and want to reach out to me. I wonder why, but here it is. Can you see this, guys? That's my tweet. Feel yes. free to reach out to me on the Twitter. And if you need my email, then tweet me and I will give you my email address because we used to get. Uh, I used to put my email address and my phone number and everything over here and it was not pretty after that. So since a long time I have discontinued sharing my phone number and my you know, Twitter is really great. Um, and I can also, because I run the past DBA virtual chapter uh, Twitter handle also. So if you uh, tweet either of them, I will be able to respond them to you. So let me see. So what happens if the tool shows the database is compatible, but the vendor will not support the latest compatibility level? That's I, I'm, I'm guessing that you, they have to work with Microsoft to reach out to the vendor. Correct. So, you know, uh, have you heard the name George Walters in Microsoft in uh, Burlington Mass here? So his job is basically to work with vendors to make sure that they actually adopt the latest and the greatest as quickly as possible. So he's like the vendor kind of godfather or a god uh, parent, whatever you want to call him, but he actually works with them. But if your vendor says he cannot support it, then I am afraid, but I would say uh, you are in a very unhappy place. So, but do share that vendor's name with Microsoft. Uh, if you can tweet at uh, MS SQL or Microsoft SQL Server or some such Microsoft handle, and they will actually talk to the vendor also. Uh, a lot of vendors, as I said, because what is happening is that due to immense amount of uh, com competition and uh, turnover because of the economy, a lot of vendors are twiddling thumbs with their development effort. So what they are really interested in doing is to give you new features so that they can sell, sell more of the software rather than be zero on their technical debt. So it's a great question, but I'm sorry, there is not a very great answer for you. So any other thing? Otherwise we are well, almost the, no, the hour. Those are, all, those are all the questions that I see. Cool. So thank you, folks. If you are going to be in Albany or Boston, um, please uh, tweet about this and I will try to find you in Albany. Uh, about, I think, eight or ten of our Boston speakers will be there and I hope to catch up with you someday in Boston. I saw one of my friends, Joe Gavin from Boston, was logged in earlier. So, uh, OK, folks, there's one last question that came in. I don't know what that is. OK, so thanks. <laughs> Aha. Thanks for us. Oh, no, no, wait. And, Somebody, Charles is saying, oh, do you know this was supposed to be a two hour session? Hmm. No, these are the lunch and learns are always a one hour session. Uh, it could be that it was incorrectly set up in uh, as the from the DBA virtual chapter. We're kind of new to setting these up, and it could be that was uh, set up incorrectly. But all of the lectures for the DBA virtual chapters are one hour lunch and learns. Okay. Cool. And there's somebody, I think, oh. uh, Charles, can you just ping me offline, my friend? If I did not answer or give you a proper answer, I would love to answer them, okay? We are close to 1 up 1 p.m. Okay. 
Yes. Okay. So thank you everybody for attending. And, and this so uh, was recorded and it will be posted on the DBA virtual chapter under the archive pages. Uh, we should be able to get that up there uh, for tomorrow, if, if not on Thursday. Cool. Thank you again. Thanks, folks. Hey, bye, Julie. Thank you. You did an awesome job, my friend. Thank you.